Good afternoon and welcome to the very first webinar of our 2019 Webinar Wednesday series. We are excited to have over 300 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. Let's kick off the fifth year of Webinar Wednesday by giving a Webinar Wednesday lunch bag to the attendee that can tell me what is the name of the iconic female image aimed at recruiting female workers for defense industry during World War II? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I do want to remind everyone that MD Publishing will host four conferences throughout the year. We have two MD Expos, we have ICE, our Imaging Conference and Expo, and OR Today Live. As our first conference of the year approaches, we'd like to invite you to join us at ICE 2019, which will bring imaging service professionals from across the nation for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in imaging. We look forward to you joining us at the Wyndham Grand Resort, Clearwater, Florida, February 17th through 19th. Registration is open and more details can be found online at attendice.com. All right, let's see who the winner of the Webinar Wednesday Lunch Bag is. Winner is Keely Matson. congratulations. Uh, we're gonna contact you to get your mailing address. The correct answer was Rosie the Riveter, good job. Today's Webinar Wednesday is focusing on women in health, health technology management, and we're excited to have five great panelists join us today. I'd like to briefly welcome each of them and give you an overview, and then we're gonna hear from each of the panelists individually before we jump right into the Q&A for the panelists today. Uh, our first panelist we'd like to welcome is Michelle Shabande, President, Owner of Integrity Biomedical Services. Isabella Garris, Director of Clinical Technology at Huntington Memorial Hospital in Pasadena, California. Samantha Jupp, Penn State Health System Director in Clinical Engineering. And Chloe Alpart, Founder and CEO of Medina's Health. And Dr. May Wang, Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder of Zingbox. Michelle, let's start with you as we get started. So please give us just a, a little bit about yourself and a brief overview as to why you wanted to be a part of this webinar. Hello, I'm, I'm Michelle Shabande, and I uh, am the owner of Integrity Biomedical Services. And uh, I want to be a part of this because I think when we are just being kind of recognized lately of women in the HTM, and it's just a fascinating that I have been a part of it for 38 years. Um, I uh, left a company after working for 30 years uh, in 2010 to open up Integrity and it has been an awesome, eye-opening time for me. And as I look back at what, where I was and where I am now and what has changed and how we can move forward, I think women have a lot to do with it. And I'm, I'm really grateful that I was uh, asked to participate with this. I think we can learn and share from one another and, and, and grow. So um, I, once again, thank you for asking me to join. Michelle, thank you very much for your time today. Our next panelist is Isabella. Isabella, if you can, give us a brief introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Jamie, and I appreciate uh, the initial introduction. And um, as Michelle has indicated, um, I think our world in healthcare technology management has evolved so much, especially in the recent years. And women have and continue to play a very important role with a lot of new opportunities that have been created for, for us. Uh, so um, I'm very privileged to be part of this very distinguished panel and certainly look forward to hearing from uh, my peers um, on their viewpoints related to women in healthcare uh, technology management. Um, I have been fortunate to be part of a few other panels and presentations um, in the past, including uh, at MD Expo and Amy and some of the other conferences. Um, so this is wonderful to see again that over the last few years, um, this topic has been highlighted and um, I hope that we will be able to continue this momentum uh, beyond today's presentation. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, a little bit about myself. I have been in the field for close to 20 years now, uh, ranging from a clinical engineer to management positions. I uh, have been fortunate uh, to work in several different places uh, across the United States. Um, 
and uh, have also been uh, very much and continue to be very much involved in a lot of different professional organizations, including the ACC, AMI, uh, HIMSS, um, and uh, of course, a lot of other uh, local and state organizations. Um, again, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to present today and uh, look forward to spending another hour or so with all of you. Absolutely, Isabella. We appreciate your time as well. Samantha, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Samantha Jocks. I'm currently the Penn State Health uh, System Director of Clinical Engineering for our entire uh, system of hospitals in central Pennsylvania. Um, just like Isabella, right, I've been in the field quite a while and uh, worked all over the country, um, previously at Texas Children's, but now with Penn State for quite a while. Um, right, and, and like most of the distinguished women on this panel, right, we've been um, working a lot outside of our given fields related to um, advocacy and things we can do to kind of move the, the needle forward when it comes to women in HTM. So um, thanks again for the opportunity, and I look forward to it. You're very welcome, Samantha. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our next panelist is Chloe. Chloe, if you could give us a brief introduction of yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Chloe Alpert. Um, I'm an entrepreneur who has worked in supply chain uh, for the last kind of five to six years. Um, I've been developing software products for over 10 years. Um, and Samantha, I'm actually from State College, Pennsylvania, so go Penn State. Um, and uh, really, my background um, is looking at how I can use technology and software systems to improve um, supply chain logistics and empower people. And I've always been so inspired by materials management, clinical engineering, and just HTM in healthcare. And the fact that, you know, there's tons of existential shifts in the market right now, and there's a huge opportunity to empower women and the people who work in these sort of, you know, unsung hero positions using technology. Um, and so that's really my motivation. And uh, I have been working on Medina's Healthcare for about um, not quite two years, and um, very stoked to be here, very awesome to connect with other women who believe in entrepreneurship and how women can really make a huge difference in healthcare. Chloe, thank you so much. We appreciate you being a part of the panel as well. And rounding our panel out today is Dr. May Wang. May, if you could, it's your turn to introduce yourself to our attendees today. Sure, thank you. My name is May. I'm a CTO and co-founder of a company called Zingbox. And in Zingbox provides security and operational insights for connected medical devices. Mm -hmm. So lots of clinical engineers are using our product. We use machine learning, we use cloud, et cetera. And I'm one thing particular I'm super proud about Zingbox, and that's also why I'm here at uh, this panel, is ever since day one, since four years ago, I started the company together with my two male partners. Came, we mm -hmm. came out. And for research. Until today, we have always been keeping one third of our uh, work, work staff as women. And now today we are, we're based in Silicon Valley. We have more than 60 people and one third of them are women. So, and I myself have learned lots of lessons, le uh, made lots of mistakes, and I'm very happy to share my experience and uh, help next generation young women in technology and healthcare. Thank you so much, May. And just to give the attendees a little insight, we collected some questions as you did register for the webinar. Uh, so we're gonna start our Q&A process with the questions that were submitted from attendees during the registration process. But I do want everyone to know that you have the opportunity to submit questions for our live Q&A to the panel today. You can do so by using the questions feature on your webinar dashboard. You're welcome to submit a question and we will pose it to the panel, or you could identify a specific panelist that you would like to address your question. With that said, I'm gonna jump right into the questions that we have ready. And May, if it's okay, I'm gonna get started with you. The first question is, what advice do you have in regards to career advancement? Sure, very happy to address that. Because we work a lot with biomed engineers, clinical engineers, we actually do see a huge trend coming up. So one, if I have to give one piece of advice specific to this group of uh, great clinical engineers and uh, managers, I would say to identify the new wave 
and get onto the new wave to grab new opportunities. One thing we started seeing is right now we're at a tipping point of in terms of clinical engineering. Maybe many years ago, clin clinical engineering is mainly about, you know a lot about these medical devices, you know a lot about their mechanical characteristics and the properties, you know how to maintain them, how to operate them, et cetera. But nowadays we started seeing this new trend because a lot of these medical devices are connected onto the internet. Even though we don't really expect biomed engineers to become experts in IT and security, but we do see among many hospitals, if the bioengineers can work together well with IT and security people, that brings lots of value to the table. Some of the pioneering hospitals are even merging the two groups together because we see lots of new characteristics and challenges that are brought by the connectivity of all these medical devices. So that's one piece of career advice I would like to give specifically to this group of great biomed engineers. That is, there's new great opportunity coming up on the horizon. And if you, you can gra grab that and can go a long way. I love that. That is truly great advice for career advancement within the HTM field. Uh, Samantha, I would love to hear any anything that you'd like to add for this question. Sure, so so my advice is probably a little more general, um, but I would say, right, for, for advancement, um, my mantra throughout my career has really been, right, to focus on the results and the work ethic of the work in front of you. It's really not about the amount of time that you put into work. A lot of people think, you know, if I work more, then I'm gonna go ahead and get the opportunity for advancement. That's not necessarily true, especially in this field. Um, I find that if you really um, provide value and focus on the results and your work ethic, that really allows you the opportunity to shine. Um, and my second piece of advice really focuses on something that the field doesn't do well um, and is drastically needed, I think. Those of you that can focus on growing skills in the areas of conflict management and conflict resolution, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on in our field today and the ability to kind of navigate between different camps who have different um, uh, goals or interpretations of what they want to get out of something, that skill is, is a limitless skill that will truly help you pro propel your career forward. I love that. I, I, I agree with you. It's not always the hours that you put in, but the work that you put into the hours. And I think this first question is going to tie into the second question that we'd like to pull up. And Michelle, I, I'd like for you to address this one first. What obstacles or stigmas have you seen in the profession and how have you overcome them? Well, I really believe one of the big obstacles for me personally is that I was a woman going into business in kind of a standard of a man's world. Uh, Business-wise, I'm, I'm the one that runs the business. I'm the service provider. I'm the equipment purchaser. I sell the equipment. Um, working with uh, the biomeds there, getting to know who I am, that I can have the proper people, hire the proper CBETs, hire the proper clinical engineers, uh, the proper technicians, to assure them that just me owning the business and having the proper people to, to, to run the business and have them know that they're going to get a quality product. So for me, business-wise, that has been something that I've had to come in. And like I meet with a group of uh, business owners. Most of the people that when I attend the shows, the MD Expos, which are excellent shows, um, most of the most of the people that I the vendors there, you know, we're all together. We come together. I'm 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 kind of a minority, so to speak. I know a couple of other women that own the businesses that that own businesses that are there. So that's something that we've had to come against as a woman-owned business, uh, um, HTM business owner is something that we are still overcoming. I mean, we're we need more. We need more to take go out there and say, hey. We can do this. We can be in the HTM in a business and run business the way um, a, a, a man would, or you know, or as equals in this in this. And, and we're welcomed. 
so, I mean, a lot of my uh, colleagues that I've known for 38 years are, are men and they uh, have welcomed me in this. I remember when I left the company that I was with for 30 years, I had one man come and say, I'm proud of you. I'm glad you did that. I'm here to help you. So there was that like, you know, in the very beginning I was all, you know, what did I do? But then again, it was like, I'm so glad I did because they did give me knowledge. And I have about three or four that I go to and I say, listen, what about this? Or what do you think about this? And so I've learned from them too, how to be successful in this business. That is fantastic insight to being a woman uh, owner of an HTM company. Isabella, I'm hoping you could provide any insight to obstacles or stigmas that you've faced working within a healthcare facility. Um, sure. Uh, Michelle did, did a wonderful job um, also uh, providing a response to that, um, but let me chime in with some of my viewpoints on this. So um, so I kind of go back uh, many, many years ago when I was um, doing my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, and this was actually um, in Cape Town, South Africa, and I was just thinking about the composition of the woman-to-men ratio, and um, we literally had about two or three women and probably a hundred 20, 130 men in, in the more traditional field, obviously, of engineering. Um, so uh, what I have observed over the years is, is also a transition in that, uh, perhaps not so much in some of the more traditional fields like electrical and mechanical, uh, but certainly in the clinical biomedical engineering field, um, what we have seen, and I think others can attest to, uh, more women uh, coming into this field, which is wonderful to see that. Because um, I believe, uh, and, and it still happens, we have a highly dominated field by men. However, what I have learned, uh, and perhaps some of the obstacles that I had to overcome helped me with that, I believe a lot of it also comes uh, from developing a very uh, strong partnership with, with your peers who are men. Um, I have many mentors uh, in the field um, and have had them for a long time. Uh, who are men and have provided me with um, great insights and great resources that helped uh, me shape uh, the career where I am today, uh, not not uh, not only within everything that I do here uh, within the hospital, but also a lot of the extracurricular activities um, through professional organizations or conferences or even things such as uh, the webinars that we're doing today. Uh, so I think um, a lot of it is also uh, being able to um, establish a certain level of, of confidence uh, as an individual, as a woman, um, which, as Michelle indicated, uh, sometimes it's, it's not easy in the, in the male-dominated world. However, if you can do that and show the strength and the confidence, um, I think it will certainly help you a long way to be able to uh, establish yourself in the field. And also, most importantly, what I believe in is establish a, a circle of resources and partnership with others, which can certainly be other women, but um, most certainly a lot of other men, since we have a men-dominated field, uh, that will uh, continue to support us, because um, I have that support system and I continue to enjoy that and reach out to that on many different occasions. So I think one of the main things to help overcome some of the obstacles, especially if you feel that, um, that you are uh, faced with some within your professional career uh, is not to be afraid, uh, build, uh, build a confidence level and a support system that will certainly help you over time um, if there are any, overcome those obstacles and be a successful uh, female in the field. Thank you. And Isabel, I'm going to stay with you for the next question. What do you think that leaders and women in the industry could do differently to bridge the opportunity gap? Great. So, um, so I think as I as I mentioned in my first question, that kind of helped with um, with overcoming some of the obstacles. One of the main things, and and speaking from experience, that has uh, certainly worked for me. Um, and I would like to encourage, especially young women, getting involved in that as soon as they can, even during their uh, college time, is to get involved in a lot of the extracurricular activities. Um, like I said, professional organizations, whether it's on a, a national level, state level, local level, um, I've mentioned some of the key organizations, especially those that have regular meetings, the ACC, AME, HIMSS, and of course, a lot of your uh, local professional organizations. 
um, not to be afraid uh, to actually start even volunteering for some of these organizations, um, whether it's a, you know it's a position on a committee or a task force or just helping out uh, during the organization of an annual conference. Um, there is definitely plenty of opportunities, and many of these organizations are always looking for volunteers to help out. Uh, to me, that was one of the the biggest and the most important breakthroughs in my career, especially at the very beginning, to be able to be exposed to other professionals in the field, again, including women and men, um, that over time will help you build that support system and will help you become um, uh, you know, a stronger and a better leader in, in the field. I think um, other things that um, we should be looking uh, forward to, to do, especially within um, your own individual professional environment, is to look at what options uh, you have for any type of training or uh, other type of leadership courses that will also help you, not just necessarily as a woman in the field, but as a leader in the field, uh, establish yourself, uh, build stronger, again, support system, tap into the resources, and be able to learn new techniques uh, to improve on your leadership skills. That is fantastic advice, and I, I certainly appreciate you sharing it with us. And listening to the panel so far, there are a couple of things that have come up that, uh, Michelle, something you said about your male counterparts that were your advocates, that were some of your biggest cheerleaders when you made that decision to step out on your own and start your company, leads us to our next question. What are some of the ways you have benefited from or worked with male advocates in advancing your career? We heard from Michelle earlier, so May, I'd love if you could address this question for us. Sure. As uh, as a uh, couple ladies have panelists have already mentioned, in lots of places we are working at, male person. Colleagues are still dominating the field, especially in high tech. And my two co-founders are male, and uh, most people we talk to, partners and investors, are all male partners and uh, colleagues. So I do find their support is extremely important. And even though sometimes men, women think differently, but as far as we have the right attitude and are willing to sit down to communicate our different opinions, our different views, I found most male colleagues are very willing to listen to us. And uh, if we show the equivalent appreciation support, we can e easily get appreciation and support as well. And actually, before Zingbox, I was working at a very large company called Cisco, for many years, I was working at Cisco CTO office, and for years, I was the only female because it's a very technical role, so pretty much including myself in the group was a nerd. And for many years, I was the only female engineer in that group. And actually, every single time, in hindsight, every single time I had any kind of career advancement, it was all because another male colleague or my boss who every single boss I had was a male who was able to recognize the work I did and spoke up for me and got me to the next level of the career. So I, I think the most important thing is you provide, not only you work on the things that you are passionate about, but also you need to pay attention about what are the things valuable to other people, to your group, to your boss, to your company at a high level. And once you are able to provide value to them, not only you need to work hard, work smart, but also you need to make sure there are people who can recognize your value and recognize the value you bring to the table and are willing to speak up for you. So I think having great colleagues, having great boss, having great partners, would um, having the whole, as um, both Elizabeth and Michelle mentioned before, having a great supporting system is very, very critical. Isabella, is there anything you'd like to add to this question? 
Gosh, May, uh, May was so thorough in responding to this. Um, I, I certainly uh, echo everything that she has mentioned and um, will also uh, say that most of my bosses uh, so far have been uh, male, um, except for one. Um, and I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, the partnership that I have developed um, with them and have certainly learned quite a bit from them as well. I think as women, and, and I'm, I'm sure we can attest to that, um, we often uh, have that more emotional side, that more nurturing side, uh, that sometimes you know we we have to balance with everything else in our professional world. And what I have observed with my um, male counterparts, even my peers or the the people that I have reported to, um, certainly learned uh, new techniques and new ways of addressing things. Um, sometimes they're uh, with less emotion, uh, more direct and more to the point, um, which again, depending on the situation, you have to um, be able to respond to certain things very quickly and very effectively. And sometimes uh, the different type of techniques that I have learned uh, from them, kind of no fluff, just, you know, let's go with it. <laughs> then I keep on questioning things 10 different times, um, has really worked. And a lot of that, especially in my younger years, um, I have uh, put to good use and now have, uh, you know, hopefully perfected it even uh, further in my professional life as it has evolved. Um, so certainly a lot of uh, a lot of good things uh, have developed as a result of that female-male partnership. Um, at the same time, I have also learned uh, quite a bit from my female counterparts too, and I'm happy to say that. Um, we are seeing more and more, not just on the, the distinguished panel that we have today, but also if you attend any of the professional conferences, it's always great to see uh, female leaders in the field um, attaining high-level positions. And a lot of that is based on how their careers have evolved and the support system that they have developed that we've talked about already. And a lot of that is the support system and the partnerships that they have uh, developed with uh, male counterparts. Um, so I'm very thankful for all the male counterparts that uh, have touched my life up to now in my professional career and will continue to do so as I believe we learn uh, from each other. And I hope that they can say the same thing about the partnership and hopefully they have learned certain things uh, uh, as well that will and have helped them in their career progression. Samantha, as we begin to dive deeper into women in the HTM field, I, I'd love for you to speak a bit about what you think is the most significant barrier to female leadership within this industry. Well, thank you. And so I think, you know, I'm going to echo something that a lot of the other um, panelists have talked about, and that's, right, the mentorship opportunities. We do have um, right, a lack of female mentors when it comes to bringing those up, you know, below us. And I think, you know, a lot of us that, that are uh, where we are in our career today have relied on, right, those partnerships with other male colleagues or other partners within our field. Um, but there are very few female leaders within our industry. And so I think one of the biggest barriers to continuing to grow the female leadership is just um, the lack of female to female mentorship when it comes to um, opportunities and it comes to right um, education and things that right a good mentor can give you. I think you know one of the things we really need to grow as a community is the ability to not only mentor right those around us right and, and our colleagues, but I think we really need to to reach that mentorship down into levels right, in the high school um, and college areas where we can really start to recruit more women into our field. And that one-on-one -on -one mentorship is usually, right, the one reason somebody enters the field is because you found somebody, right, who really lit a fire underneath you. And so um, until we really get a lot more um, mentorship opportunities, I think, you know, it it's going to continue to struggle to get more females in leadership roles within HTM. Samantha, I'm going to stay with you because I, I feel like our next question is very much in line to what you were just addressing. How can women attain more leadership positions? 
Sure. So, so right, the first thing I put on my list when I made notes for this was you need to find a mentor. And I think a lot of our panelists have talked to it, whether it's female or male, you really need to find a, a group of people that you can rely on to get advice um, and to learn to work your way through some of those sticky situations all of us end up dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, second, I would say, right, you need to go forward in, in a confident and passionate manner and truly advocate for yourself as you're trying to um, move up the rungs, right, in your organization or across organizations. Nobody is a better advocate for your um, abilities and where you want to go than yourself. And if you can't stand up and be confident about the skills you have and passionate about the work that you want to do, right, people will easily pass you over for those leadership positions. Um, you know, and so sometimes, you know, all of us um, are not necessarily have that, that innate ability within us to, to toot our own horns. And that's really where then we rely on our, our mentorship, our, our partnership, our uh, network of, of um, camaraderie to, to guide us in the right direction or right, maybe toot our horns a little bit for us so that we can really become visible to those in senior leadership levels and help us move up that ladder. May, is there anything you'd like to add to this question? Yes, sure, absolutely. Um, thank you for all the great points, Samantha and Michelle mentioned. I think mentor is super, super important. If I can add something more, I do see as everybody agrees that women tend to be very caring and care about others, especially for women working in healthcare. The reason we're working here because we care about others. We want to take care of others. But I see that also can be a barrier or obstacle for lots of women moving for, uh, moving towards leadership positions because lots of really smart, hardworking women I know at certain point in their life because they have family, because they have kids, they have different priorities. They value their family, they value their kids much more. So they started to pull back in their career path. So one thing I think is very important that we have a great support system and both at work and at home in the community to help us take care of families so that women can spend more time and energy at, um, uh, at work and also we, also need to make sure whatever we're working on has a meaning, has a value that we really um, value a lot. So that makes every single minute we are away from our family, we dedicate it to work, is very, very meaningful and um, a valuable time we're spending. A third point I want to say is uh, going back to at the very beginning I mentioned, I think, I feel it's relatively um you can say relatively easier to get to leadership position if it is a booming area, it is a new area, or it is a cross-section. The not many existing players are in this field, then it's easier if you take initiative, you take the leadership, it's easier for you to um, become leader, to lead a new area. I agree, and May, I'm going to stay with you for this next question because I think you're going to provide some valuable insight. How have you personally built confidence or resiliency over the course of your career? Oh, that's a great, great question. Again, before Zingbox, I was working at Cisco with, I think they have a, about 100,000 people, which is a huge organization. I know many healthcare systems are even bigger than that. And uh, for many years, I was I was this pure nerd, you know, I got I got my PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford. I, I, I felt I knew really well how to talk to computers, but never to human beings. And uh, there was one mm -hmm. time that my boss had to give a presentation to a group of very important large customers. And for, he had something urgent that he couldn't make it to this presentation. And he just came to me. I think the only reason he came to me because probably I was the only person staying in office that late in, uh, in the day. So he was like, May, can you do this presentation for me? I was like, okay, you know, public speaking wasn't never, was not never my forte. Actually, speaking wasn't even my forte. It's still not my forte. But I just took the task. And I think uh, it, was a, it was a job doing for our salespeople. And I think probably sales had never, ever seen a, a nerd who could complete a whole sentence. So they were pretty happy with the result. And ever since then, I got invited back to do more presentations to our large customers, even though that wasn't part of my job responsibility. It wasn't counted for my bonus or anything like that. 
but because it could help our sales team and uh, um, they just needed to grab somebody to do the technical presentation for our customers. And in hindsight, actually, through that practice, I built up more confidence in my presentation, even though I'm still a very soft-spoken person, and very often my colleagues said I can become a CIA agent because I always talk so quietly as if I'm telling a secret. And also, and it turns out it broadened my view tremendously. It brought me out of this, my little office and pure technical world. I started talking to lots of customers, talking to partners, which turns out helped us a lot when we started our own company. Now I know a little bit better, learned a little bit more about how to communicate on something you're so passionate about. T communicate that well to your potential customers, to uh, people in any walk of life who might be able to support you. So. Again, probably I will never be able to become the greatest orator in the world, but still, I, through practice, through taking all these challenges, coming out of my comfort zone, I can improve myself and provide some value to the, to the group, to the company. I'm still probably the quietest person in the room. I still talk very softly sometimes when I have to go to give a presentation representing the company. I had to ask the backstage staff who's in charge of audio to crank up the volume on my microphone. And actually, I remember once an uh, audio guy told me, oh, I tell you a, a trick. You just imagine all these people, hundreds of people in the audience. You imagine when you're super mad at your kids, when you're super mad at your husband, you just yell at them. So just start yelling at the 600 people in the audience. I tried it, it really worked. So there, there are things you can overcome. There are things, even though it wasn't your most confident area, you can, through practice, you can, you can get better. I love that. We, we all got a good giggle about screaming at the audience. That's, that's good advice. I, I'm sure that does build confidence and resiliency. Uh, I want to hear from a couple of more panelists on this question because I do truly love it, and I think it's going to uh, be a, a valuable resource for a lot of our attendees to know how they, too, could build their confidence being a woman in HTM. Uh, Michelle, let's go to you. What, what could you provide for this question? Well, um, you would... You would kind of never know, but I was also very shy at one time. And I, um, over the years, because of the passion that I had for what we were doing, you know, in, in, in reality, uh, being in this business is indirect health care. We are so important, but people don't know about us. So knowing, taking that note and saying that people need to know who we are it gave me the confidence to go out on my own. It came, it, you know, it was the worst decision, but the best decision that I ever, ever did in my life was I was so comfortable with where I was. And I had, uh, you know, looked at just the comfort of, 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 of the, who, who I worked for, what I was doing, but also was so passionate about it. When the opportunity came, it was the confidence and that certainly that step, leap of faith that I went out and said I can do this. So you know, you, like they're saying, the the more you the more you present yourself. I am the presenter of integrity. So every time I go out to a to a place, every time that I go out somewhere to have to do a presentation on integrity, it still continues to build my confidence. So knowing what I have behind me, who I have behind me who is with me, going with me, even though they're not physically with me, helps me to build the confidence to continue. Opening up new venues, uh, doing better marketing, going and seeing our customers and taking that route of who, this is who we are. So I think confidence um, is something that you you gain by continuing to to know who you are and know what you're doing and know what you stand for. And I always tell my staff, you know, it's, it takes a full team. So I never say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I don't think I'm more highly than anybody here. We're all on the same page because we can't work this, this business without one of us 
we all have to be together as a team. So knowing that my team's here taking care of the business while I'm gone or while I'm away, that builds confidence and a surety to know who integrity is. And Chloe, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Could you share a bit about how you built confidence over the course of your career? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, two things when I look at this question are literally it's just confidence and resiliency. And how you achieve these things is through failure. And I know that seems somewhat counterintuitive, but everybody has this pressure to be perfect. And everybody always focuses on how they're perceived and what a lot of people are thinking of them. And, you know, one of the luxuries we don't have in healthcare is failing because when we mess up, you know, people's lives are on the line. But there are other ways that you can practice failure in learning a skill, in, you know, trying to find knowledge. And whenever you try to work on a problem, that's really hard. You know, when you, you try to punch above your weight, when you read a technical publication that just seems like you can't make it through, you might fail, but you've just inched a little bit further in your competence and your confidence. And every time you work on a really hard problem, you're just building your resiliency. So, you know, your career in any sort of leadership role, starting a company, starting a new job, you have to fail a little bit. You don't learn how to ride a bike the first time you get on it. You have to practice, you have to fall, you have to scrape your knee. But the only thing that you can control is your own attitude and the own, and your reaction to that situation. So kind of going, you know, echoing what May and Sam said, if you can focus on how you respond to those reactions, how you can keep your attitude positive, how you can also put yourself in the way of really challenging problems and use those failures and those successes to build your resiliency. People are going to see you as somebody who's consistent, who tries, who's honest about their successes and failures, and somebody who moves fast. One of the key things in seeing your career growth and how you can move is being fast, be willing to fail in a way that you can control, and then using that learning to grow. I love that. And Chloe, I, I want to stay with you. I, I'm hoping you can provide some insight for this next question. Give us some background on how you became an entrepreneur, and what advice do you have for any women that are looking to follow a similar path? Well, uh, entrepreneurship for me, I think, was baked in the cake. Um, Medina's Health, um, which is a marketplace for pre-owned equipment and materials management tools, is actually my third company. Um, before this, I built an API company that set a world record for largest instant win prizes that were brokered. And before that, I actually built a company that handled supply chain and logistics, importing um, minerals and colored gemstones from all over the world into the U.S., and um, for me, it's it's just a compulsion. I'm one of those people where I see a problem and I really need to solve it. And I think what's very interesting is people often ask me what the best piece of advice I've gotten was. And I could probably talk about 20 different really wonderful things that you could put on the wall. But then I had somebody ask me, what is the worst piece of advice you've ever gotten? And I realized that the worst thing that somebody has ever said to me is, oh, just do it tomorrow. And the key thing about entrepreneurship is just getting started. If there's a problem that you need to solve, do it today. If you see an opportunity to create change, to help people, to solve a problem, to help somebody, just start and start doing it. And kind of going back to the resilience and the confidence question, entrepreneurship is a series of failures. You are doing structured failure testing. And the only way that you can make it through and be successful is to have that grit and have that resilience to keep trying to find that solution and have the ability to just start. We spent probably six months testing different supply chain op you know, operations for Medina's Health before we landed on one that our customers loved. But it took us six months of building a lot of software and a lot of failure before our customers were finally saying, yes, this is what we want. This is helping us solve our problems. We've saved money, we've saved time, you've made this easier. But up until then, Every day we were getting up, we were building a solution and we were being told no, we were being told it was wrong and it was a failure. And that's very painful because a lot of times you can internalize that. Internalize that. Now at the same time, starting a company is very difficult because there are financial considerations. You have families, you might have children and that's very, very hard. The one thing I will say is that I have, um, similar to May, two male co-founders and having people that have my same value system as co-founders um, and people that I've worked with before um, is something that I feel so privileged to have the opportunity to do. 
because those guys are like my brothers now. And having good people that you work with is the difference between success and failure. I've had a previous company fail because I hired the wrong team and I had the wrong people beside me. But in this particular company, I am surrounded by the most wonderful people. A lot of our customers have become friends, have become mentors in a way. And that's because we focused on really good people and we focused on getting started and we focused on not making the same mistakes twice and learning from those failures to find the truth. Michelle, as a successful entrepreneur, I would love for you to chime in on this question as well. Well, I agree with what Chloe had said about having the right people with you. Um, my husband was behind me 100% financially. He knew I was ready to go. He was the one that pushed me and said, you know, get out there and do it. You've been wanting to do this for years. Just let's, let's do it. And uh, with his push and his prod, and his, you know, his, his, his trust and faith in me, especially with our finances, <laughs> we, we, uh, we, uh, integrity was born. But the two people that came with me also from the other company are uh, ones that I uh, want to entrust one day um, the, of running the company. So you do have to look to the future. You do have to, as a business owner, you do have to have a succession plan and not be afraid of that. You have to know that one day you want to pass it on. I, am, I didn't have the opportunity to fail. I had to have it work. I had to know what I was doing because I had to know this was what our own finances was going into. And we were very blessed to have, uh, you know, customers that, um, that believed in us. They had, to, they had to believe in me because I was selling, okay, I'm doing this now, and can we help you do this? And uh, they believed in me. So, you know, we are very, it, is, it is something that uh, I said like before, taking a, a leap of faith and believing that this is, this is going to work and it will work and it, you will watch it grow. Um, I am very, very blessed to have um, a, a team I mean, I can't stress that enough that the team here is what helps me to do this job every day. You know, one of our things that I from, uh, said last year was that, you know, if I was just an owner getting paid, that, that's something different. But no, I'm actually working here. I'm doing the job. I, that This is my job. This is what I get paid for. This is what you get paid for. So it is something that we're all... Uh, no, wanting it to grow. We're wanting the business to grow. We're wanting it to change. We're wanting to get with the times of, of the very business like ours. When I started Integrity, there were probably a handful or, you know, not very many companies out doing what we're doing. Now, there's, you know, three times the companies doing it because, uh, you know, I know two people that had left companies to start their own companies. Uh, it's, it is something that we live in America. We can do that. Uh, it is, it is something that, you know, be your, be an entrepreneur, go start something that you have passionate about. But I think you also have to have the passion. Once the passion leaves, it's very hard to get back. So to, in order to keep that passion going, there you have to go with the times. Our business has changed from the time we opened in 2010. So has other people's businesses. So definitely it is something that I truly love. Um, we also say, you know, our word is our word. That's all we have. So the integrity of, in, of integrity is something that I really instill. Whenever we hire somebody new, they go through the processes of what we all believe in. If they, we feel for one moment that they are not with us on that, well, we don't hire them because we have to be one team. And I'm very grateful that for the team that I have. Thank you, Michelle. And being mindful of time, we are about 10 minutes out from the 60-minute mark. So I'm going to jump around a bit on the rest of the questions that we have scheduled. We've gotten quite a few from the attendees today. There are some that I, I feel like we do a great disservice if we don't get to. Uh, Chloe, I do want to hear from you. What will be the biggest challenge for the generation of women behind you, and what advice do you have for them? 
Oh, wow. That's a really tough question. Um, what I think is interesting is that there's a lot of kind of multiphasic changes. Um, I do think women are slowly going to start to penetrate um, those leadership roles. And I think that I look to the women ahead of me and I look at all of the foundations that they laid for us. And now we're getting the opportunities. But a lot of what I see, and I think especially for the women behind us, is going to be unconscious bias. The problem with unconscious bias is you can't really point a finger at it. You can't really call it out or say what it is or sometimes even find a solution. And so women are going to have to focus on what they can control and how they can continue to grow in the face of any sort of adversity. And on top of that, I think women are always going to have the age old challenge of, you know, having children and having to, you know, be at the same caliber when you're nine months pregnant. That is a, a huge consideration. Um, you know, you're batting two down and have to hit the same home run as the guys next to you. And I think really it's just focusing on the resilience factor and understanding that, you know, the future is going to be technical. Um, every technical skill that you can bring to the table, everything that you can do that just feels like it's impossible, go and try to do it anyways. Even if you only learn 50% of the skill, you have 50% more skills than you had before. And that is amazing. So I think it really kind of comes down to understanding that unconscious bias is not about you. The only thing you can do in the face of that is control your own reaction and focusing on how you can be better. And also just accept that there are going to be realities where you just have to be that much better because sometimes, you know, you're you're batting with a handicap and that's OK. But that's that's how it has to go. And women are strong and women can do that. Thank you. And Isabella, I want to circle back to you. We've had a handful of questions that have come in and all of them are dealing with the same topic of either identifying a mentor within the industry or becoming a mentor within the industry. So I'm hoping you can provide some insight on mentorship within the healthcare facility. Uh, sure. Yeah, of course. So so again, the mentorship uh, program, as we have talked about, and I, as we've mentioned, it was touched by m uh, many of the women on the panel, uh, can certainly be done uh, through um, the the insights of your institution, whether you're in a hospital or some other private uh, private type or or public uh, institution. There are several programs that, more and from what I'm hearing, more and more um, institutions are developing, especially as we have. Uh, younger, uh, new to the field, clinical engineers or healthcare technology managers uh, coming into the field. For example, here at Huntington Hospital, I have recently hired um, a clinical systems engineer right after his uh, master's degree. And uh, we have a kind of an uh, informal process, but it, it's more of a mentorship um, type of a, a program where we get the individual groomed into his position, uh, you know, have him experience the real world, uh, pr start participating on projects, meetings, and, and getting him more acclimated to the real life environment that he will have to see as part of what, uh, what we do here at, at the hospital. Um, however, there are also a lot of different programs uh, outside of your own institution, and I know um, Amy uh, currently, and I'm sure other organizations as well, especially on a local or state level, so you don't have to tap into something uh, nationally, offer these type of mentorship programs where they actually um, have you... Uh, have you submit your name as one that is interested to receive a mentor and mentor is matched with you know your particular interest uh, professional interest personal interest and so on to be better suited uh, to stay with you and provide you with uh, whatever personal uh, professional growth that is required to get you through a certain stage within your career and that could be for a few weeks or a few months or how, however long that is and the good thing about that is a lot of that can certainly be done online or on the phone or through other uh, through other means. It doesn't necessarily have to be in person as, as again, some of these mentors are assigned to individuals that are not necessarily you know, in close proximity to, uh, to the individual that they're mentoring. So uh, certainly a lot of opportunities, and, and I'm sure I speak for others as well, uh, 
uh, that were, you know, within our industry were always available to uh, provide the insights. And, and myself, I can personally say that if there is anybody that is interested in exploring anything further or has any additional questions, uh, I'll be happy to be that resource. Um, I do here and there uh, get emails or phone calls from individuals asking about these very uh, questions about mentorship and opportunities and, you know, what can I do to get into the HDM or a clinical engineering career? What are some of the things I should be working on to further my career or become a, a better leader? Um, we do get that, and I'm, I'm sure others um, as well on the panel, uh, which is great that um, that others see us uh, in that capacity. So, again, I encourage uh, everybody to continue that because um, all of us here and others in the field can certainly be a great, uh, continue to be a great resource for this. Thank you. Samantha, I want to go over to you for this next question that came in from an attendee. This attendee is new to the HTM field. What is a good way to learn the compliance and regulations and stay up to date? Oh, so there's a ton of, of available resources to go ahead and help you through that. I think some of the organizations that we've been talking about have large programs to help that. So Amy does a lot of webinars, ACCE does a lot of webinars um, to try and help you stay abreast of some of the changes, especially in the regulatory section. Um, there's also all kinds of resources through your regulatory group. So if you're in a hospital, um, usually there's a regulatory group that has some access to um, a, a direct joint commission or a direct CMS kind of link. Um, and then for those of you not aware, a lot of the regulations are different from um, state to state. And so a lot of your state governments will have a ton of webinar resources or online resources to help you navigate um, what those independent state kind of regulations are, because those vary significantly depending on where you live. Thank you. And guys, we are being mindful of our 60-minute block today, but I want to get in one more question, one last question, but I do want to tell all, all of the attendees that if you haven't heard your question read to the panel yet, what we're going to do is there's quite a few in queue. We're going to send all of these questions over to each of our panelists today, and they will follow up with you offline to provide any answers or insights into the questions and challenges that you're bringing to the table today. Um, but I'm going to round out, uh, Samantha, I will stay with you for this one. How hard is it to be valued as a woman in technology? So to be honest with you, right, in a field such as ours, right, to be valued as a woman, um, to be honest, you just need to be valued. And so I would actually completely eliminate the line between genders and really look to just provide value. Um, and I think in healthcare, it's a little bit easier because a lot of the, the customers we serve, um, the nurses, right, and, and some of the physicians tend to be a female population. And so that value doesn't necessarily look like it's different between genders. Um, as long as you're providing services, you're providing something to your customers that's that's useful to them, that they value, I think that's really where where we shine as, as HTM professionals, right? I think Chloe's done a great job trying to figure out what, what people need and provide that. I think May and her team at Zingbox has been doing a fabulous job trying to figure out what do we need Right, they've really studied their customers and therefore have provided a service, right, that makes their customers happy. We internal to the hospital need to do the exact same thing, right? Our customers are not hospitals, our customers are nurses and physicians, but we have to figure out what makes them happy, right? And we have to act in a way that provides value to them. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely, and I think that is the perfect point for us to wrap up today. Uh, of course, thank you to all of the ladies for this great and informative webinar. I do not think that we could have start, started the fifth year of Webinar Wednesday on a better note, so kudos to each of you. Thank you for your time and expertise. I do want to let the attendees today know that this was just a, a precursor to the next panel discussion that MD Publishing is preparing. We are going to have another all-woman panel discussion at our MD Expo Houston. The dates for that are going to be April 11 through 13, Houston, Texas. Registration is now open for this expo. So if you enjoyed the webinar today, you're seeking some certification and you want to be up to date 
on uh, the, the parameters within HTM, MDX, though, is going to provide lots of education to help you do so. You can find more information on this conference at mdexposhow.com. As a reminder, all hospital employees and healthcare facility employees, military and students can attend the MD Expo for free if you're using a VIP pass from any of our exhibitors for the conference. Again, the website for that is mdexposhow.com. One lucky attendee will win an, Ama an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey today. The survey is going to appear on your screen shortly. You must complete the survey to obtain the certificate of attendance, the 1CE credit for the ACI. If you do not see the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. For more information on our 2019 webinar series, you can visit Webinar Wednesday Live. We will be right back here with you next week in a few weeks uh, with our next webinar for 2019. Again, the upcoming calendar is going to be on webinarwednesday.live. Thank you so much for your participation today. See you soon.